What's up, biohackers? I'm here with Dr. Jade Teta, and we wanted to cut you guys in on this conversation right away because he was <laughs> dropping some wisdom about his experience going with a big publishing deal, what he liked about it, what he wasn't crazy about, what he would do different next time. And I know a lot of you guys have a book in you. Some of you have already released that book. Some of you guys are still working on it. Some of you guys may decide you never want to put it out there, but I thought this was a conversation you'd like to drop in on. Quick background on Jade. He's an integrative physician, author, and sought-after expert in the realm of metabolism and self-development. He spent the last 25 years immersed in the study of strength and conditioning, hormonal metabolism, and the psychology of change and success. And we are going to be talking about whether or not metabolic damage, i.e. damaging your metabolism, is even a real thing. But first, Dr. Tata, welcome to the show. Anthony, thanks for your work, brother. It's good to be here, man. How are thanks, you? Thanks for your work. I'm excited for us to chat, man. So tell me a little bit about, before we get into metabolic damage and, and some of the nitty gritty of where your expertise lies, I was, you, you piqued my interest discussing your experience <laughs> with a big publishing deal, because right now I'm on the fence about whether or not that's a, a path that I want to pursue with my next yeah. book. And I would love to hear what, what your experience was like. Yeah, well, you know, I think all of us, I and mean, I know there's a lot of professionals that listen to your podcast. I think all of us, right, we kind of have this, uh, there's this natural inherent sort of conflict between marketing and our true message, right? And so we want to put our message out there, but we also know we have to market it. And so I think this is the first place that I ran into with dealing with, you know, I got a, a pretty, as a first time author back in 2010, I got a pretty big deal for my book called Met The Metabolic Effect diet they at one point wanted to call that the sexy me diet right now look sexy, at me man i'm sexy this me. sexy me diet right so me and my brother these sounds two like bigs, a right said fred track <laughs> i know man so you know here we are look we're like hey do you guys are you even looking at us like i'm this big bald mean looking dude who lifts weights <laughs> my brother and i are serious fitness people and we're like you're gonna call our book the sexy me diet there's nothing sexy about us you know so we fought with them very hard to get that change. We, you know, to me, the metabolic effect diet, and I'll tell you guys a story because it's funny. The metabolic effect was the name of the book. Then they changed it to the sexy me diet. We fought like crazy. They it ended up being called the new me diet. What's interesting is we, we were, we we're like, what, me and my brother are both sort of, you know, laid back guys and sort of like these people who are like, we don't know what we don't know. Let the experts in books do their thing, right? And, but it turned out we were right. Our actual agent and the publisher later said, when we release the paperback, we're going to release it under the name that you originally wanted, the Metabolic Effect Diet. Now, that was HarperCollins. Moved to Rodale, we, we sold the second book, which was supposed to be like, you know, the Metabolic Detective or ME 2.0 or whatever we were going to call it, but something with metabolism in it, because that's what we do. Right. And they called it Lose Weight Here. And we fought that, but weren't able to sort of overcome the publishing. And so what I was telling Anthony, for those of you who were just jumping in, just before we jumped on this call, is that based on my experience in that world, I think it was good to sort of do a major publishing um, agreement at first. It's hard to do, obviously. Um, but now I'm to the point where I kind of want to self-publish because I want full control of my work. I think what has happened to me is in the marketing world, I sell online DVDs as well and have an online publisher. And any of you who have seen some of my work outside of sort of the professional discussions would immediately have an eyebrow raised towards my work. I'm kind of embarrassed about the market even because it goes to these extreme sort of places sometimes that we can't always control once we sell our stuff. So I guess this is probably where the term selling out comes from, right? You know, so we, we all hear this in music and we hear it with actors and actresses. And I'm just like, you know what? I don't want to, quote, sell out anymore. I want to keep my messaging clear. But I do think, the final thing I'll say about that is I do think it, for those of us who are thinking about releasing books and stuff, I do think in the beginning to get your platform, it's probably a good idea if you can get published, get published because they will definitely get your book in a lot of places you couldn't yourself. But then once you have a platform, which you obviously do, and so do I, I think it's probably better just to self-publish because you can always go back the other way if that book takes off you can always go hey look at my proven sales now i want you to publish this under its name under the way it's written without your hands in it and that's kind of where i've been so i've been i've had a tough time managing this 
marketing world versus my, my true message world. And I think it's uh, damaged some of my reputation to some degree, but more importantly, it's not really about reputation, right? It's more about like what you feel as a creator and the work that you're putting out and how happy you are with it. And so I'm less happy with that other work because I think it's been tainted a little bit with the marketing spin and a more universal uh, sort of message when my message is more nuanced and gray. So I don't know if that makes sense to you or you have follow-up questions with that, but that's kind of where I am right now with that. It's sort of a, a journey that I've taken over the last you know, 10, 15 years, and I'm pretty solid on now the direction I want to go. It took me a while to figure it out. It does make sense. And, and the follow-up question or questions that I have. So looking at what you know now about negotiating contracts with big publishing houses and what's possible, uh, yeah. is there something that you would have done different during that negotiation, whether it comes to your advance, whether it comes to what's expected of you in terms of running Facebook ads to sell your book, how much you're supposed yeah. to spend of that advance, whether it's the amount of time that you're allotted to write it, whether it's creative freedom and final, final say so. What change, what would you have done differently? Yeah, the two big things, man, two things I caution everyone against. Number one, make sure you fight for um, the actual title that you feel comfortable with. Now, of course, they know how to sell books, but still, if it feels wrong, it probably is wrong. It needs to be something you can own. Think about me 10 years later telling people I wrote a book called Lose Weight Here. It doesn't make me feel great. It almost is embarrassing when I say it. it's kind of cringeworthy to me in some ways. But so when you're thinking about the title, whatever they offer, just say, what is, what, am I going to be happy with the title 10 years from now? And fight for it. Because, it, of course, in the beginning, you're in, you're in charge, especially if you have a big platform, because that's what the agents and publishers are looking for. If you have a big platform on any of the social media sites, you get lots of podcast listens, things like that. They're going to take you seriously. They want your listenership. You have power. So that's the first thing I would have done differently. For, for someone listening who's wondering if they have enough, if they've got a big mm -hmm. enough following, what do you consider the type of following that publishers are looking for in terms of quantity and per platform? Yeah, actually, I can answer this pretty clearly because my agent, who's one of the best agents in this industry, Celeste Fine, talks about this all the time. She, she sort of says, if someone has, you know, a big following, it's going to be, you know, in the 50,000 range in, on Facebook, probably in the 20,000 range on Instagram, at least, and a pretty big email list near the hundreds of thousands of people. And that's a moving target, you know, so she would have said less previously, but that platform is pretty big. And, you know, I would say tens of thousands of listens, you know, per month on a podcast, right, where it's like people are you know, paying attention to you. So she's pretty clear on this and those targets are moving. And when you pitch your book to a publisher, you know, really what you're doing is pitching to an agent first because you kind of want that agent. They're going to work for you. They get paid if you get paid. So when you're pitching your book to an agent, they're going to want to see what your platform is. And, and in reality, Anthony, they want, they want to see platform. They want to see that you have followers more than they want to see your idea. A lot of us go, oh, I've got a great idea. They go, you know what? We see great ideas all of the time. It's can you actually help us move this book? So it's their, their, their platform first, idea second. All of us, right, because we're creators, we're like, oh, idea first, platform second. Not the publishers and not the agents. They want to see that you've got a big platform. And so those numbers matter. And they also want to see engagement. So I think just be careful about, you know, trying to, bot your way or buy your way to, you know, uh, sort of engagement on Instagram and stuff like that. That stuff can be tough because using bots and using buys doesn't always get you good engagement. Right. You see so that. I think that's, that's important. That, that's fantastic <laughs> advice, man. Far more specific than I expected, but that's exactly what I yeah. was hoping for. And you do yeah. see that all the time on Instagram, like 250,000 followers and a picture that's been up for a few weeks has like 300 likes. Yep. Yep. And, and, you know, we all, we all can see it. And of course it is like one big high school, right? It's like, you know, is this person popular or not? And should I follow him? It works to some degree, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff and they will look at stuff like that. So you can't really fool, um, you know, sort of the agents and the publishers. And by the way, you wouldn't want to anyway, because if you're actually going to get real sales, 
um, you need a following. They do nothing but give you distribution. They really don't give sales anymore. And that's one thing to understand. Going with a publisher, they help you with distribution. They do not help you with sales. They now expect you to do that. They just allow it, you know, allow you the ability to, you know, get your book out there quicker. You know, and I guess that brings me into the second thing I would say. The second thing I would say that I would do different is back when I first started this, I put a lot of money into PR firms and stuff like that, trying to get on the doctors and, you know, Dr. Oz and all this kind of stuff. And I've watched my colleagues who have been pretty successful in doing that and seen that my stuff has sold better than theirs, even though they've been on some of these big shows. So what I would put my effort into now is not trying to get a big PR firm to do traditional PR, but instead, based on what Anthony said, I'd be putting money into my own Facebook ads, my own Instagram ads, my own um, sort of infrastructure where I'd set up a program that goes along with the book so I can grab those emails and sell to those people because the book, you make some money off of that, but if you go with a publisher, you make very little. Where you're going to make money is off the programs that are associated with the book. And so to me, have the infrastructure ready, right? Don't spend a bunch of your money on PR. That's not going to get you anything. So what if you show up? How many times have we seen someone on Dr. Oz? Probably none of us even watch Dr. Oz, by the way. I certainly don't. But if you see someone on Dr. Oz, how often are you going to go and be like, oh, let me go check out their website? You're just not going to do that, right? And so to me, skip that stuff. Take the thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 that you'd be spending on PR Put it into your own ad campaign and build a program that goes along with the book so when someone reads that book and gets excited about you you can filter them into your program and that's where you make your money that's that's awesome advice jade i'm curious yeah. do you run your own facebook ads or do you work with someone or an agency and you kind of direct them on what you want but they do it. Both. both. I have a, one company that I work with that bought my company. I, I used to run a company called Metabolic Effect for those who, who know me. For those who don't, it was a health and fitness company. I sold to another company called Metabolic Living, who they have their own ad campaign. However, I also have jtita.com, which I run my own ads on Facebook and stuff like that. And just to kind of give you a heads up on that, um, for those of you who are working with a brand, some of you have a brand, right? some of you your brand is you as an individual my whole take on that is that you kind of really want to build both um so i do have a couple brands next level human is a brand of mine that's a business metabolic living is a brand of mine and jay tita is a brand of mine and what i really do now to keep things simple is i basically people know me by my name so jade tita basically i run everything through that primarily and i do that myself and then my other companies um, where I have partners and stuff like that. We usually farm that stuff out you know, to different agencies and things like that. But I do think in the beginning, if you're going to really do the business that we're in and you're going to be a true internet entrepreneur and be pushing your, your message, you want to learn this business to a degree. It's funny, I've actually started teaching this stuff as well to you know um, people just like us. I'm doing a live event in um, Los Angeles in a couple of weeks just because people are not really savvy to this way of doing business because they're used to doing brick and mortar stuff or they're used to sort of, oh, I'm a blogger, or I'm a podcaster or whatever, and they don't necessarily know that there's a lot of ways to make money once you have that following, just with a few key steps that you can do all by yourself. Um, you know, it's funny, my team right now with jtita.com is me and my sister, who's my assistant. That's it, two people, not a whole lot of, now in these other companies, it's huge, right? There's like hundreds of people in there that are getting paid, but with jtita.com, and what that does is that gives me the ability to pivot, right? To, to basically be like, well, I know that jtita.com is always going to be there. If this other brand goes away, I still got jtita. And people are always going to know me as jtita. And so that's kind of how I look at that. That's pretty wise. So you're, you're diversifying not just industries, but brands. And you're building a, a number of separate brands that all stand independent of one another. And then you've got a mix of diversified traffic sources ranging from organic to paid that you run and then paid that you outsource absolutely that's exactly exactly how i'm doing it yep all right pretty cool man well beautiful thank you for sharing that hopefully the the entrepreneurs and people that are into the business stuff also like nerding out on <laughs> yeah, that absolutely. as much as i did let's take things back to your experiences in the health space you mentioned in your bio, you've been called a quack, you've been called a witch doctor. How does, how does someone 
<laughs> what type of behavior precedes someone being called a quack? Yeah, you know, it's funny. You know what? You know why you get called a quack and a witch doctor? You get called that when you follow your own path, when you move away from convention. And um, I don't know how, how well, how much you guys read psychology and philosophy, but I'm pretty steep in that stuff. And Adlerian psychology is, you know, the, the three big, huge guys in psychology were Freud, Jung, and Adler. Not a lot of people know Adler. We've all heard of Freud and Jung. But one of the things that is the hallmark of Adlerian psychology is this idea of the courage to be disliked and the courage to be hated on. And this idea of having a thick skin and not really caring so much what people think. And in fact, using that to your advantage. And so call me weird, but being called those things, I know it's probably weird. And this is absolutely the truth. I actually take them as a sign of a compliment almost. Because what it means is when I'm being called those things, what it means is that I'm not doing what everyone else is doing. And as much as someone might be thinking, you know, this guy is off his rocker or whatever, other people are like, I really dig this and this can help me. And so to me, I've always seen that as a reflection of the other person and their, their inability to have an imagination and be, um, you know, sort of stuck in convention. And so I've never really looked at it, you know, necessarily as a bad thing, even though I know some people that can crush them because I just, I know who I am. I know what my expertise is. I know what I know and I know what I don't know. And I'm confident in that. And that confidence has been built over time. And I guess I would say everyone's going to be called that at a time if they break from convention. Now keep this in mind, right? It was completely on purpose. When I was, when I went to naturopathic medical school, which is probably, again, talking marketing, the worst marketing mistake in the world was ever calling that profession naturopathic medicine, you know, because it's just an odd name. But I knew going into that, that, um, that it was going to be controversial. And at that time, alternative medicine was not uh, popular. So then you got to go back. This is back in 1997, right, where doing that was considered like now everyone goes, oh, I know what that is. They didn't even know what that was back then. And so that's what happens. You're going to be called things. You're going to be hated on. You're going to be, you know, um, looked at funny whenever you break out and do your own thing. Now, I, I think now that people follow me, they know I'm very science based. I merge. Uh, I'm very conventionally minded. So what happens to me, Anthony, and I, it may happen to you, I don't know, but here's what happens to me. People in the alternative natural medicine world can't stand me because they say I'm too conventional. And people in the conventional world can't stand me because they say I'm too alternative. And I like being in the gray zone because to me, the middle child. That, yeah, you know what I mean? And to me, <laughs> black and white thinking is, is not where we are. The world is gray. And so I, I am science-based but I'm also not without imagination. This, this thing that we all do is both art and science. And anyone who says differently doesn't understand it. For sure. When you mentioned the word convention a few times, going against convention, when it comes to health and wellness or, or medicine, define convention. What, what was it that you were moving away from that you didn't resonate with? Yeah, well, very simply, um, so 25 years in the health and fitness world as a personal trainer, I, I did the gamut like a lot of you. You know, I was, the, I, I was like, everything's calories in, calories out. You know, I was like, uh, you know, if you're, not, if you're not getting results, you're just lazy and, a, you know, a glutton. Mm -hmm. And what I saw is that this stuff just failed. If you're honest, calories in, calories out works for the, the super fit, you know, lean fitness models and dudes like me at the time who were just hardcore into fitness. It did not work for the vast majority of my clients who were coming in off the street. They would get some results for 12 weeks and then that I would make them fatter. They would get, they would come in fat, get lean, and then they would leave even, you know, I would see them later and they'd be even fatter than they were. So to me, I just looked at that just with you know, common sense. It was like, something is wrong with this model. And so convention to me is in our world is essentially for lack of a better term, eat less, exercise more. That is convention. That model absolutely fails 95% of the time. We know this and research has shown this. So I'm a science-based guy. There is no doubt this shit does not work. Sorry, it does not for the average person. So that's convention. Now that's not to say that calories don't matter but they matter differently, but go ahead. So when you're saying eat less, exercise more fails 95% of the time, we're talking about 
lasting results, right? That's, yep, absolutely. Do we know over what time frame we're talking? Is that like losing the weight and keeping it off for a year? Is it yep. five years? What are we talking here? Yeah, so they define success in the research. They define success as losing 10% of your weight and keeping it off over the year right? So you, in order to be defined as successful in most diet studies, you have to lose 10% of your weight. And remember, they don't really make a distinction between body fat and body weight in most of these studies. And you need to maintain that for over a year. So what we know is that about 95% of people either can't do the diet, never lose the weight to begin with, and or they lose the 10% and gain back the weight within the year. Okay, so only about 5% of individuals lose 10% of their weight and maintain it over a year. And that goes down even further at year two and year three. By the way, 66% end up fatter as a result of doing the diet. So here's the thing, right? Let, let's say that, I don't know, let's say in any other model, in any other industry with a track record that poor, it would have been thrown out long ago because we would just said it does not work. But, it, but the eat less, exercise more model is alluring because it, um, it works in the short run. Anyone can lose weight for over a 12 week period and everyone's like, oh wow, look what they did. And then you see them a year later and something's wrong. So what we now know is that dieting does something to our physiology that makes it far more likely we will gain that weight back and makes it harder to lose weight at future times. So a lot of people can remember a time where they just didn't give a shit about working out and exercise and just worked out, ate what they wanted and stayed lean. And then they went on their first diet. And next thing you know, their metabolism has not been the same since. Now, we all sort of know this. So to my, so when you talk about Jade, what is convention? I say, well, that's convention. And there's obviously some truth to it. That's convention, and there's obviously some truth to it, but um, it is uh, not a, a model that works over the long run. So I would say this, a perfect diet or a perfect exercise program or a perfect plan that does not work over the long run is not a perfect diet, a perfect exercise program, or a perfect plan. It's a short-term fix at most, and it's a broken model at worst. Yeah, a diet and exercise plan, even combining those two, and if they're, even if they're both great, you're saying it's not enough in 95% of the cases to work. That's, exa that's exactly what I'm saying. And I'm also saying this. Now, just because we say it doesn't work does not mean there's not a lot of truth in that. And this is where people want to go black and white. So they go, here's what we do, right? This is, this is what we do. We go, well, it doesn't work. Research says it doesn't work. So let's just make stuff up. Let's just start you know, doing juice fasts and eating these random diets and like they just start making stuff up out of thin air which have no basis in scientific method or uh, clinical experience at all yeah. and so people go all the way over to the other side and then it's just all this random nonsense there is a middle ground and the middle ground is essentially say well calories obviously matter we know that from science we know that that's important then the question is well if what we're doing doesn't allow for a sustained calorie deficit what do we have to do to create a sustained calorie deficit? And my answer to that is, we need to do things that control hunger, that balance energy, that manage cravings, so that what we're doing can be done over the long run. Because the eat less, exercise more approach by its very nature in most, but not all people, leads to increased hunger, leads to unpredictable and unstable energy, leads to insatiable cravings, and now we know leads to a metabolic decline that makes it very difficult to maintain a calorie deficit in the first place. So instead of throwing out the baby with the bathwater and saying calories don't matter, it's all hormones, why, why do we do that? Why can't we just say, you know what, we should be looking after hormones as well. And by the way, when I say hormones, I'm not talking testosterone and estrogen and progesterone and insulin so much as I'm talking about the hunger hormones like CCK and GLP and GIP1 and all these things that keep us satisfied and also managing things like cortisol, which we know lowers the motivation centers in the brain and stimulates the reward centers in the brain. So all of a sudden, we can take that calorie approach and say, okay, let's put the hormonal approach, the quality approach, the lifestyle approach on top of that, and maybe we can make more of a difference. Instead of going to these nonsense fad diets and 
ridiculous making stuff up. So both can, can be used is what I'm saying. You hit something huge there by mentioning cortisol. We're talking about the stress hormone here and chronically elevated levels of it. You're going to also get decreased insulin sensitivity. So your body going to have a difficult time converting a lot of that food to fuel. It's, it'll be an inefficient process. We see so many people stressed as fuck walking around, you know, on, on the edge of adrenal burnout. So it, it is critical to figure out, is our cortisol rhythm off because our lifestyle is too stressful? Are we in a toxic relationship? Are we doing CrossFit seven days a week? And, you know, fueling that workout on a ton of coffee, like all these things can throw off our hormones and then throw off our metabolism and make it feel like no matter how hard we diet or how much we exercise, it's not going to work because like our body's hormonally off, right? And toxic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And here's, here's one thing I say. I mean, I, I love the stuff you do in the biohacking world and things like that. And one of the things that you'll you, um, you will always hear, right, is people will jump on a single mechanism. Oh, my God, insulin, right? Once you learn, once people, I always laugh. No, it's, it's funny because once, No, it's great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And they start pointing at these single hormones, which never works because the hormones work like people, like they, they socialize like people do, right? So insulin in the context of high cortisol and low HGH and low testosterone is a fat storing hormone. However, insulin in the context of high human growth hormone, low cortisol levels, a balanced calorie load is a hunger suppressing hormone and a muscle building hormone. So insulin is not a bad guy. It's the context and the social environment that it's around. What other hormones are around with it? So when people first learn the mechanism of insulin is sort of a storage and locking hormone, they forget that there's 10 other mechanisms, one being the cortisol mechanism. You can Cortisol, you can eat your way into insulin resistance, right? Or you can stress your way into insulin resistance. And if you cut carbohydrates too low, then you can actually raise cortisol levels, which will disrupt insulin receptors, causing insulin resistance. And so every time you run into a mechanism that you think solves the world's problems in weight loss, you have to remember the body is redundant. The metabolism has multiple mechanisms. There's 10 you don't even know about yet. <laughs> That's a good point. It is, it is important to stay humble and keep perspective on the fact that at every point in history, we thought we had shit figured out. And similarly, at every point in history, when we look back on where they thought they had shit figured out, we laugh at how much they didn't have. But when we're there, like right now, we think we got it figured out. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I read a ton of philosophy and my boy Socrates, I mean, everyone knows the name Socrates, but they don't always know what he stood for. Well, the Oracle of Delphi, basically, the Oracle of Delphi said, hey, Socrates is the wisest person in the world. And when he heard this, he goes, surely that's not true because he was a very humble man. And then he went around and talked to all these wise people and he came away and he goes, wow, I really am the wisest person in the world because I'm the only one who says I don't know anything. And that's the thing that, that sets Socrates apart and sets good practitioners apart when they just go, you know, I think that makes sense, but I better keep my mind open because there's so much more that I don't know. I just know a fraction of metabolism. I don't know a whole lot. So we can't get caught up on this mechanism. I call it mechanism chasing, where a lot of people are just like, they learn a new biochemical mechanism, yes. and then they cannot get their head out of that and realize that you honestly are just learning the tip of the iceberg in metabolism. It is not all insulin. It is not all calories. It is both, and it's a whole lot more. Yes. Yes. Oh, it's, it's a fascinating world we've created <laughs> it really is <laughs> you you mentioned three things before control hunger was it balance energy and manage mm -hmm. cravings yeah Let, let's go through those one by one and you know if you're up for it share your number one health hack biohack whatever you want to call it yeah. um for let's say controlling hunger yeah. Well, first, let's distinguish hunger from cravings, right? So hunger is a feeling of fullness in the gut okay. and or a feeling of emptiness in the gut. When you're not hungry, you're going to feel full in the gut. We all know what that feels like. You can be busting at the seams and you're like, wow, I'm full or I'm very empty. There's almost like a gnawing sensation. Exactly. <laughs> so that's hunger. Now, how do we manage hunger? 
Um, we manage hunger. This is very clearly laid out in the science. It's one of the few areas that we know how to manage hunger. And it comes down to the acronym PFW, protein, fiber, water. Protein, fiber, water. Protein, fiber, water-rich foods. When we look at macronutrient content right now, again, you know, this is what's a problem with reading popular books and following popular gurus and things like that. They're not always up on the science. Fat is not the most satiating macronutrient protein is. In fact, most research suggests fat is the least satiating macronutrient. This is very clearly defined in the research, but we get confused because when you combine fat and protein, that's even more satiating than protein by itself. And so we have to be well, careful here. A whole bag of macadamia nuts straight through. It's, absolutely. But try it. Yes, it absolutely is. It absolutely is. <laughs> I never so feel full. I, I'm like, I shouldn't yeah. go to Trader Joe's and get another one of those, should I? <laughs> and, and so can I. This is why if you sit down with, uh, you know, two avocados and two chicken breasts, you'll be able to crush through that guacamole pretty quick. Those chicken breasts, you're going to eat that and not feel like eating for six hours. It's the same reason why you can eat seven donuts, which are 250 calories. But if you try to eat seven chicken breasts, which are also 250 calories, you're not going to be able to do it because protein is so satiating, right? right. So I always often, oftentimes use the donut and the chicken breast because they're both 250, 300 calories. You can eat five donuts. You cannot eat five chicken breasts. And so there's something about protein that makes a big difference. It is the most satiating macronutrient. It fills you up the fastest. Fat, not so much unless it's combined with protein. That does make sense. There's also something to be said for the the fat flavors and the sweet flavors that kind of send our brain's reward centers crazy. You don't really Absolutely. get those with chicken breasts or grass-fed beef or wild-caught salmon. It's good. You know, you throw some you throw some proper seasonings or marinades or whatever on there, it's going to be real nice, but it's not like eating a dessert or even a banana, you know, and it's not like some of the, you know, like a fat bomb and some of what that does yeah. for our brain. So you eat less. Yep, absolutely. And it's, it's the simplest thing we can do. Here's the problem though, right? And this goes to the craving component. So yeah, we might be filled up, but we still, we might be full, but we're not dessert full. And this is what's sort of getting you. We still want a taste of something sometimes. And that is not hunger. That's cravings. Boredom eating is cravings. Uh, needing a taste of a flavor is a craving. Feeling like there's something left where the dessert comes and you're like, oh, I can make a bunch of room. That's cravings. And that's slightly munchies. different. The munchies. Absolutely. <laughs> that, that's cravings. And that is highly associated with stress. And so PFW, protein, fiber, water for hunger, for cravings, it's really about stress management and lowering stress and doing other things that will relax you. And here's something I always like to tell people, go have an orgasm and tell me you're craving cheesecake now. You won't, <laughs> right? Because you're in, already in that all orgasm. state. You're, you're, you know what I'm saying? Your brain is already sort of in that sort of potent, satisfied place. If you go take a hot Epsom salt bath, if you take a nap, if you go for a walk, if you get a massage, typically that brain craving will go away. Um, and so it's a really interesting thing to think about. We now know that cortisol, it, you, when you think cortisol, think C, think C for cortisol and C for cravings. The two are probably linked, partly because cortisol decreases the motivation in the centers in the brain, upregulates the reward centers in the brain, also has some negative consequences on blood sugar management. And it's probably either correlated, we don't know for sure if it's causing, but we know it's highly correlated with craving stresses. And so we need to manage that. And of course, there's some overlap between hunger and cravings. But I would say if you want a quick clinical pearl, hunger, protein, fiber, water, things like soups, salads, scrambles, shakes, and stir fries. There I tend to go. think of those, those foods. Those are the things you want to eat for, for hunger management. For cravings, you want sex and physical affection. You want massage and meditation. You want um, stretching and relaxation. You want sleep and naps. You want all that kind of stuff for craving. And if, if you're making love the right way, you're hitting all, you're checking all those boxes. <laughs> Absolutely you are. Absolutely. And you know, it's funny, I you're use that. Stretch, because you're we, getting a nap. You're getting everything. You're getting a meditative tantric experience. <laughs> 
physical activity. And, and we laugh about it. We laugh about it, Anthony, but everyone knows that, right? Like, you're, you're craving a cheesecake. You go have sex. You're going to not be craving that cheesecake anymore. You will be satiated. That tells you a little bit about cravings. We may have something here. We'll call it yeah, the, sex, the sex diet. We'll write it together. We'll be embarrassed about the name. <laughs> Anytime someone feels like they're going to go off their diet and have a cheesecake, they, they're, they're ordered to immediately run and have sex. You must have an orgasm now. <laughs> yeah, we, hey, will we be happy with that title 10 years from now is the question. <laughs> I don't know. I have mixed emotions about it. I do too. I, do too. I don't know. co-authoring it with a man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I do have a girl's name, bro. I'm just saying, so you might be able to get by on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people, people make assumptions. Oh, all right, nice. Um, what, uh, uh, rapid fire, a couple of your favorite protein sources. Well, whey protein is fantastic because it lowers cortisol and it raises serotonin levels. So it, can, it has, Yeah, if you can, but I mean, honestly, all the studies have been done on just standard old whey that's not grass-fed and not organic, and it works. So obviously, if you can afford to grass-fed and organic, get it. I like to use that stuff. If not, just get it on board. It hits hunger and cravings because of some of the brain chemistry effects. So whey is really one of my favorites. If you don't like whey or you're a vegan, pea protein has some similar properties in hunger management. Casein is probably the better dairy protein for hunger. But I like whey because it has some brain chemistry craving effects. Pea protein and casein are probably the two most satiating of the, the protein powders if you want hunger suppression long term. Um, after that, I really like the very lean, and I know this is controversial in today's day and age, but I like the lean, clean protein sources. Chicken, steak, lean versions. And here's why. Not that I'm anti-fat. Fat's fantastic. I just very want the clients I work with. Like super pro-fat look yep. awesome a lot of the guys that are like jacked and pretty lean they're still following certain components of the bodybuilder principles from back in the agreed. day agreed agreed they tend to follow a low a moderate carbohydrate low fat diet or a low carb and low fat diet and a higher protein diet as a proportion of macronutrients and they are the leanest people on the planet yep. and so i agree with you you know people who do a whole lot of fat don't look nearly like bodybuilders and they, they, they just don't eat the same either. So I like, I like lean and clean protein sources. And then what I like to do is add enough fat, but not too much fat in the form of some of those things we like. It's some, you know, egg yolks, uh, coconut oil, um, you know, olives, uh, avocados. You add enough, but not too much. So by, by keeping your protein lean and adding in vegetable, good quality vegetable fats instead of having a big fatty piece of meat, I like to do that because it allows me to be a better metabolic detective, a better biohacker. Wouldn't it be nice to know how protein affects you versus how fat affects you and how much fat you need and how much fat is too much? It's very difficult to overeat protein, but some of us, as you said, and they can overeat fat, no problem. And that can become an issue. It's yeah. I mean, if you think about just the math, one, <clears throat> what is it? One gram of protein, one gram of carbohydrate, four calories, one gram of fat, nine calories, yeah. right? So when we're adding fat to fucking everything, and then, and that's our main macronutrient, one of those underlying principles, assu assuming healthy hormonal balance, if you want to lose weight is creating a calorie deficit. doesn't mean you can't yeah, spike you have calories and like, you know, yeah. reset your thyroid hormone and every, anything, any of these things that can be down regulated if you're too chronically um in, in a caloric deficit but if you're eating fat it's easy to a, a few too many nuts calorie neutral calorie surplus it's much harder to yeah. do if you're like all right i'm gonna get my fat as a byproduct of my protein selection and i'm gonna but i'm gonna intentionally choose lean meats for right now yeah there's no question about that and the research is very clear on this so any of the keto folks which i'm not anti-keto and i'm anti-fat i love i'm i'm di i'm a diet eclectic just what use it when it works for you i like it all it, there's a there's a time and place for everything but if you're one of these people who's unsure about this just go look in the research and take your bias and dogma out of it and just go look objectively at the research you will see fat by itself is the least satiating macronutrient, there's some de debate about carbs. That's because carbs come with fiber and some carbs don't. So some studies will show carbs the least satiating. 
um, versus fat, but protein is far and away better than fat when we're talking about single macronutrients. The other thing about um, fat is it is the least thermogenic macronutrient. Proteins the most. And so it is the easiest to be stored and the least likely to fill you up. And so if you're going to use fat, what you want to do is add enough of it to your protein to make your protein that much more satiating rather than, in my opinion, um, trying to load up on fat. Now, of course, one of the principles of metabolism, one of my key laws is that is the idea of individuality, which is a lot of what you do. You know, this whole idea of biohacking secrets and things like that is individualizing your approach. Yeah. So yes, you're going to find some people who do much better on fat, but to extrapolate your individual experience to everybody on the planet is not something you should ever do. That's what research tries to help us do. And what research tells us is that your end of one experiment of you doing well on fat does not translate into the population as a whole. The population as a whole tends to do better on a higher protein diet that is very clear there is absolutely no debate anywhere among the people who are actually reading the research none on this point so if you're still on the camp that fat is satiating just admit it's for you it might be but not across the board and i think that's an important piece to look at and here's again this is what we talked about at the beginning right conventional versus your know, black white gray we're talking gray right now yeah, the very, the, the self-evident truth has become that there is no one-size-fits-all diet. That's why 95% of people, even if they're on a great nutrition program and a great workout program, they're not going to be able to lose 10% of their body weight, which is not a lot. We're talking about someone who weighs 200 pounds losing 20 pounds and then keeping yeah. that off for a year. That, that doesn't seem particularly difficult, but it's, it's not happening 95% of the time. And it's why we see people going from vegan to paleo to keto to, you know, I'm probably going in reverse order now, but like South Beach diet and Atkins. And it's, we, we have to determine the right diet for us. And it will never, ever, ever be one of these, <laughs> you know, you're, you're sort of trying to fit a square peg into a, a round hole by saying you must adhere to the dietary principles in one specific diet, regardless of what it is. It's not gonna be the, right, the perfect diet for you, ever. Yeah, you, you said that beautifully. I love the way you put that. And, and wouldn't it be nice, Anthony, if we got to the place now where instead of going into the next fad diet, and, I, oh, and then, by the way, I call it a fad not because they don't work. I'm not, you know, keto works great in some people. Fasting works fantastic in some people. I just call it a fad because they try to extrapolate to the whole, the whole of society, which doesn't work. But wouldn't it be great if the next, quote, fad was the do what works for you diet? And we really start focusing on becoming a metabolic detective or a biohacker. You know, to, you know I'm using those synonymously. And we work to understand ourselves. So we go to someone like JT or Anthony and we say, hey, I know what they're doing and they're giving me tools to figure out what I can do that might work for me. You know, maybe Jade does great on a lower fat, higher protein, moderate carbohydrate diet for the most part. But I've learned that fat really is what works for me. And so I'm gonna do that. And so for me, I'm like, absolutely. There's one rule of nutrition, do what works for you. But in order to do what works for you, you have to begin to learn to view dieting differently as a process, not a protocol. It's not a recipe. It's not a cookbook. It's not something you can go get off the shelf. It's a process of discovery. What keeps my hunger and my energy and cravings in check day to day and hour to hour? What at the end of the week when I'm including it or not including it results in fat loss? What kind of diet and exercise program makes my blood sugars and my um, uh, blood pressure and my blood labs healthy when I go see the doctor. If, if your hunger, energy, craving, sleep, mood, exercise performance, exercise recovery, libido, and all of that stuff is vital, all these sort of biofeedback tools, and you're losing fat, and your, bio, and your sort of blood labs and vitals are healthy, then that is the right diet for you, whether or not you're eating Skittles and donuts and Snickers bars, then that's the right diet for you. Now, I know Anthony and I would say that's gonna be almost impossible probably. We would, we would put our money that no one's gonna eat a diet like that and be able to achieve those three things. But if you could, I would look at you and say, well, it's working for you. Your hunger, energy, and cravings in check, you're maintaining a low body fat or achieving it. 
and your, all your vitals are healthy, that's my measure for what's a successful diet. That could be high fat, that could be low fat, that could be moderate protein, that could be high protein, that could be very rich with lots of refined white rice like in the Asian cultures or it might be pasta in the Mediterranean culture. Do what works for you. I'm loving it. So and we're back with Dr. Jade Tita getting ready for the rapid fire round. You ready, brother? I'm ready, I'm ready. What movie, book, or podcast episode changed your life? Uh, you know, um, The Matrix is my favorite movie. And I think it actually goes into Matrix 1, not, the, not 2 and 3. Those, those are not my favorite. But The Matrix, this idea that you're living in a world that is a false world, that your perception is completely different and there's this whole other world out there, I think is really useful for us, especially those of you who are coaches and get stuck in this world of, I'm stuck in the keto zone or the paleo zone or whatever. We've just been talking about this, right? There's a whole other world beyond what you think you know. And you need to be open to that. So The Matrix, to me, is, is a really a metaphor for life, for sure. And I love that, that movie. Did you hear Elon on Rogan recently say this, no. this, all, this all may be augmented reality? <laughs> Did he really? <laughs> it's great. I mean, that's what I'm saying. I mean, who knows? Maybe. Maybe we're going to wake up and there's going to be an alien pulling something out of the back of our heads and had you enjoy the ride. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> What's your definition of healthy? Definition of healthy is exactly what we talked about, actually. You are hunger, energy, cravings are in check. You can do the things you want. You feel vital and functional and on point mentally. You are maintaining and, achieve, or, and or achieving a low body fat percent, I would say somewhere around the low 20s to high teens for women and somewhere around the middle teens to you know, 10% at, you know, for men, and that your vitals, blood sugars, blood labs, kidney and liver function are all sort of normal. To me, that is how I determine that I'm living a healthy life. And one other piece, you can have all of that and still feel empty inside if you don't have a direction and a purpose, a reason that you're here on the planet. It's not about being seen. It's not about making a ton of, ton, ton of money. To me, it's about what you are doing for other people that when you leave this planet will make the world a better place. To me, that is how I see it. I dig. I dig. Good stuff. What's one product you can't live without besides your phone or computer and like, you know, the internet? Yeah, you know, that's, yeah, that's tough now, right? So if you go in, I would say um, in the realm of food, it's probably a, a whey protein supplement. I am a convenience-based guy, and I need to have something that will quickly shut down hunger because I'm one of these dudes who will go on a ravenous rampage of eating if I don't um, have that. Um, in terms of, I do use a lot of tech stuff, so if we're not talking tech, I think the next thing that I'd probably say is um, – Probably a sauna or something like that. I've been without it, uh, you know, here uh, for the last couple months since I moved to a new place in LA. And I just dig sauna therapy. It's my, one of my number one relaxation things. And um, it just keeps my body feeling good. I love the warmth of that. I can't really do without that. And I'm struggling right now because I don't have it in my life. I hear you, man. I did. I did 35 minutes on the stairs and then 15 minutes meditating in the sauna and then a cold plunge right before yeah. we jumped on and the sauna plus meditation. And then you come home shower and then I do a cold plunge in the 16 cubic foot home Depot freezer out back. I feel like a million yeah. bucks. What kind of sauna Maybe do you, you have? Yeah, so I have the Nordic sauna. It's a two-person. It fits right in my thing. I just got rid of it. And, um, but it's an it's a infrared. And I loved it. And it's just been a staple. And I do the same thing. Um, I oftentimes fill up my bathtub with ice water. And or if, like, in, I, I live in both places, North Carolina and L.A. So I'm back in North, in North Carolina. The shower water is freezing. But here in L.A., the groundwater is too warm to do a cold, you know, sort of blast. And so here I got to set up my... Um, my tub with ice in it if I'm going to do the cold plunge. But I love that back and forth contrast hydrotherapy. Nice. Yeah, me too. What, what's your go-to whey protein powder or brand? I, I use, I have my own product that I use called Craving, uh, Craving Shake that's a meal replacement. 
and it's a New Zealand grass-fed whey base with. Oh, there um, you go. You know, yeah, so I use that one. Um, I also have another one with the, the, another company that I work with called. Um, it's a, a grass-fed protein. It's a metabolic super protein from Metabolic Living, which is um, I use as well. Those two. Nice. We'll link to those in the show notes, and uh, I'll I'll have to check those out. Last one. How do you get motivated and stay motivated? Yeah. You know, that's never been a tough thing for me, actually. Um, but I'll tell you one practice that I've done. I, I tend to stay motivated and driven. Um, but one thing that I have done is I have this saying that I use. Some people say, rise to the occasion. And what I say is, it's better to create the occasion. So I have started to create sort of these what I call fear PRs in my life. So, you know, like a PR in the gym, right? If I can do 500 on deadlift, you know, 510 would be my personal record, right? Well, a fear PR is doing things that um, are a little bit uncomfortable, whether it be traveling or doing snowboarding for the first time if you haven't done it, or even holding a snake if you don't like snakes or anything like that that sort of gets you out of your comfort zone. And so, no oh, joke. Go have an, an orgasm. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to have an orgasm while I'm, I have a snake around my neck or something, right? It's, it's like doing things that um, are uncomfortable and different that I feel like overflow into my life. Believe it or not, this is something that I actually um, do. I've, again, I've been out of this. You know how we go through things at work for us and then, th and then we somehow move away from them? As I moved to Los Angeles, my new pace in L.A., it's been a couple months since I've been doing stuff like that, but that's typically what I do. Oftentimes it shows up in the gym, you know, where I'm just like, I got to, you know, get this sort of actual PR. That's why I think a lot of us like training, but I also do a lot of stuff in planning, planning trips where, you know, I'm going to go like, for instance, this year in the last couple of years, I've been um, looking at conquering my fear of the ocean. So I've been scuba diving. I've been, I went, uh, you know, to, went out about, you know, 400 yards off the coast at Cabo and went swimming in the ocean for, you know, and doing stuff like that, that just is, that really messes with my head, man. You know, so that kind of stuff just, uh, it's, it, it's what keeps me living in a sense. So creating these occasions where I can be in a little bit of fear. Have you seen Spielberg's Jaws? Uh, <laughs> dude, Jaws is terrifying, man. That's probably <laughs> changed. Every, it probably is the reason I'm afraid of the ocean today. I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think it's, it's like, a lot of people our generation. Like, most people are afraid of the ocean. <clears throat> yeah, and you I don't want to watch that, that movie. Dude, I put that on when, when my ex-girlfriend and I had moved to Del Rey. A few weeks into us living here, I had her watch that. And even though it was done like in the seven, late 70s or like early 80s, something like that, she was screaming in the living room, terrified. The next day, we're walking to the beach. And there's a, a young couple, shark swims right by them at Delray Beach. There hasn't been a shark attack here in 15 years, right? And that was like some weird anomaly of a, of a lifeguard swimming too far out. And he like put his hand in a shark's mouth and got a little cut up. The next day, everything slows down. You see this mom running out of the water. The dad picks up the little kid and he's running out. She's screaming, shark, shark, like just like out of the movie. And I, my ex-girlfriend's looking at me like, is this really happening? And I drop my stuff and I run over there. And the guy's like, oh, it's a foot and a half dorsal fin on this tiger shark. He's like, huge fish, probably a, you know, oh um, my eight, God. Foot, yeah. eight foot fish. And I was like, I couldn't believe it, dude. And I mean, there was no way we're, she wasn't getting in the water for like weeks. It still took me a few days to get back used to it. Anyway, that's that's the little yeah, that's you know, scary. Honestly. That thing was right in the surf too, huh? Right? Yeah. See, yeah, I'm the, with you. The on timing that. was just yeah. weird, weird. So coincidental. It was it was eerie. Um, last bit. Tell us a little bit about, about the metabolic effect diet. What's 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 that got going for it? Well, that that was my first book, and the way to think about that is it's we all need if you're gonna if you're gonna tell someone do what works for you humans still need some certainty, don't they? They're just like, I don't like that because that's trial and error. So they need some structure. And so me the metabolic effect diet was my first take at structure. If you're a complete beginner to metabolism and weight loss, this was really about 
doing some of the things that we know can teach you about food and teach you about your body. So the metabolic effect diet really stratifies people into three different metabolic types. Now, of course, we know there's no such thing as three different metabolic types. There's infinite metabolic types. However, it's useful when you're doing writing a book to get people, put people into a box as a starting point that then helps them find their individual type. So that's what the metabolic effect diet, my first book sort of did. My second book, Lose Weight Here, brought that one step further and said, okay, you kind of gave you a structure. Now we're gonna teach you how to be um, sort of the metabolic detective. And that's the approach that I typically use across the board and everything I do is this structured flexibility approach. We start you with structure because we know the human brain needs it. And then we teach you, hey, you're meant to tweak, adjust, change, sleuth like a detective so that you can fit this to yourself. It's like my boy Bruce Lee says, absorb what is useful, discard what is not, add what is uniquely your own. So every program that I build, every book that I write usually starts with a structure and then teaches people how to adjust that structure based on their physiology their psychology and their personal preferences. And so that's what my books and my work tend to do. And I think that's, you know, it's not perfect yet, but as we all start to move in this direction of the do what works for you diet, um, this is my approach to it. Start with a structure, become flexible within that, slowly but surely you begin to approach what works best for you. And then of course we know the metabolism changes so once you find what works for you, it will inevitably change through life stages and things like that. But that's not a problem because hopefully you learn the process of discovering what works for you and you just repeat the process. Instead of doing what most people do, which is find a diet, that stops working, find another diet, that stops working, try to find another diet, that stops working. Instead, what we're doing is saying, here, let's start with structure, flexibility, teach you this process. And then it's learning to fish instead of being given a fish. And that's my approach with pretty much every piece of work that I've done. Dr. Jade Tita, this has been awesome. For people listening who want to stay up to date with things you're working on and cool stuff coming out, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, you can go to my website, jadetita.com, but uh, probably the best place right now, we're all hanging out on Instagram like, currently, so at jadetita on Instagram, definitely follow me there, and I definitely try to do my best to answer DMs and things like that, so if you want to DM me and ask a quick question, as long as it's not super in-depth, I'll try to accommodate you, but I would say at jadetita on Instagram, and then my website, jadetita.com. And we will link to those along with the metabolic effect and lose weight here. For all you guys hanging out, all you biohackers, this is Anthony DiClemente and Dr. Jade Tita reminding you, don't just treat the symptoms, find the root cause, and you too can have superhuman health. Thanks a bunch. Mm -hmm.